Greetings, everyone. Oh, are you all awake today? Greetings. <laughs> uh, my name is Brady Witten, and it is a privilege to welcome you to worship here on this Memorial Day weekend. Today is also Trinity Sunday. It's a day we remember and celebrate that we worship a God who is one in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And as we worship today, uh, we're going to hear a sermon that explores the question, uh, what story do we tell about God? about humanity, about ourselves. Uh, I invite you to stand as we join in our opening prayer for Trinity Sunday. Let us pray. Father, you sent your word to bring us truth and your spirit to make us holy. Through them we come to know the mystery of your life. Help us to worship you, one God, in three persons, by proclaiming and living our faith in you. Grant this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Today's reading is from the book of Acts. Fellow Israelites, listen to what I have to say. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with deeds of power, wonders, and signs that God did through him among you, as you yourselves know, this man hands it over to you according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of those outside the law. But God raised him up having released him from the agony of death because it was impossible for him to be held in its power. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand so that I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. Moreover, my flesh will live in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One experience corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Fellow Israelites, I may say to you confidently of our ancestor David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Since he was a prophet, he knew that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would put one of his descendants on his throne. Foreseeing this, David spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, saying, He was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh experience corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that all of us are witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 persons were added. 
They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So during the summer months, uh, we're going to be reading through the book of Acts, and in particular, the first through the 15th chapters, because that's all we can get through in the summertime. And didn't it feel like Patty just read like half the book of Acts to us right there? But we're going we're to read it in chunks like that. And, uh, and last week, we started in the book of Acts with the story of Pentecost, which was the day that the disciples were gathered in Jerusalem for a Jewish festival, and we're told that the Holy Spirit was poured out upon them, and tongues as of fire appeared above their heads. Uh, there was a sound of uh, a rush of wind, and we're told that they spoke in other languages and that all the people gathered there heard them speaking in their native tongue. Uh, So today's reading picks up with the sermon that Peter gave to that very crowd. So we're still gathered there in Jerusalem on that that Pentecost day, uh, and Peter gives a sermon that we're told cuts these people to the heart, so much so that 3,000 of them become followers of Jesus on the spot. Now that must have been quite a sermon, right? And, uh, And What I want to ask you to think about a little bit is this. What was it about this sermon? Y'all just heard it. What was it about this sermon that made them respond in such a powerful way? Now, I do have to say that uh, one of the things I've learned in, in in the years of preaching that I've done is what the preacher thinks that they said and what the people hear the preacher say are not always the same thing. It's a, pre- it's a pretty fascinating phenomenon. So uh, I'll never forget the time that I was preaching a sermon to one of my congregations about the importance of Sabbath and the practice of Sabbath and how Sabbath is in the Ten Commandments. It's one of the top ten and how we all need a day of rest and how God designed us to be, to be a people who need rest. And, uh, and, I, and I told them kind of on a practical note, I said, now look, for me, Sunday is not a day of rest. And so I have to Sabbath at a different time. Uh, and so I told them I try to take off on Fridays, and Friday is really my day of rest. But, but the sermon was about Sabbath and the importance of Sabbath. And while the congregation was leaving the church that day, one of the, one of the parishioners came up to me and said, all right, preacher, we heard you loud and clear. Don't bother you on your day off. This is, this is what, and I was like, no, no, that's not, that's not what I was trying to say, right? But so again, sometimes you read these sermons and what the preacher thinks that they said is not always what the, the people heard. So in my Thursday Bible study this week, we were talking about uh, this sermon that Peter gave, and I was asking them, what do you think made, made the people respond in such a way that 3,000 people gave their, gave their lives to Jesus? And uh, some of them said that, boy, Peter really laid into that crowd there, didn't he? I mean, telling them, you know, you're the ones who killed Jesus, and, and they, maybe they felt so guilty that they gave their, gave their lives to Jesus. What do you, what do you think? Is that what it was? Is, was it, did, you, did you sense a little guilt in that sermon? Or how about this? At the very end of the sermon, Peter uses this kind of preacher word. He says, repent and be baptized. Uh, Maybe that's what did it. Uh, Was this a fire and brimstone type of thing uh, where where people knew, "Uh uh-oh, I better straighten up and and, and follow Jesus? Is, Is that what it was? What do you hear in this sermon that you think moved the people uh, in such, in such a powerful way. So I recently learned of a field of psychology that intrigued me. Uh, it's called narrative psychology. And the field explores the power of the stories that we tell and the effect that they have on our lives. So there's a professor of psychology named Jonathan Adler at Northwestern University who's someone who's, who's been teaching and, and talking about this, this practice. And he offers a practical example of, of, of what, what I'm talking about. So he tells the story of a middle-aged man uh, who went out on a date with a woman who, who was to become his wife. So the, the story does end with them getting married. But they were out on their very first date, and uh, they went out to dinner, and they had a lovely time together. And when they came home, and they were standing on the porch and he was just leaning in to kind of get a good night kiss that the light flipped on on the front porch and her dad threw open the, the front door and there, and there they were sort of standing like deer caught in the headlights. Now, this man told the story in this way. 
He said, it became a story that bonded the two of us together. Uh, when we went out on our second date, we laughed about it, you know, about, ha, oh, I remember your dad kind of thrown open the door. And, and he said it was a story that went on to help them to grow closer to one another and that years later they still told the story and laughed about it. Now, what Jonathan Adler, this professor, points out is that the couple could have narrated this story in a very different way. They could have focused on the embarrassment that they experienced. Maybe the guy would have thought, oh, I can, I can never call her up for a second date because, you know, I'm so embarrassed and I don't, I don't want her dad to see me again. And, and again, do you see where the story could have been told in a very different way and that it could have been an event that didn't bring them together but it drove them apart? Now, neither version of the story is more accurate than the other in a factual sense, right? They went out on a date, they sat on the porch, dad, dad flipped on, the, like, like, like the story is the story. It's the choice of the narrative that makes the difference. And this is what narrative psychology kinds of, kinds of looks like. So perhaps you can think of an example of your own life that fits this. Uh, maybe you lost a job at some point in time or you were facing some other difficulty, but you chose to tell a positive story around what happened, right? Well, losing that job, it hurt, but it led me to find another path that really kind of, that, that I was really happy with. Or you know what? Getting that diagnosis was terrifying, but it really made me appreciate the, the things in life that, I had, that I'd kind of been neglecting, right? You with me? This is this idea of narrative psychology. So this is, I think, what really caught my attention when I heard this. Narrative psychologists call a positive narrative a redemption sequence, and they call a negative narrative a contamination sequence. So narrative psychology posits that when a redemption sequence is present in someone's life. It's usually accompanied by a, a sense of positive well-being, life satisfaction, lower levels of depression, and higher self-esteem. And the opposite is true for a contamination narrative, okay? So you're with, with me so far? So when I first heard this, I, of course, thought of the stories that I tell myself about my life, right? I'm going, oh, Brady, what, what stories are you, are you telling? Are you, are you telling redemption narratives or are you telling contamination narratives? Uh, but as a preacher and as a theologian, I also thought this. What does this say about how we understand God and the stories we tell about God? What does this say about the human story that we tell ourselves? Like, what, what's, what's happening here? What are we in the midst of? And what does it tell us about how we read the Bible? Do we understand the human story as a redemption sequence or is it a contamination sequence? Is the Bible the story of a God who's mad at humanity and who is coming to get us? Or is the Bible the story of a God who loves humanity and who came to save us? What do you think? Which, which way do you tend to go? Which way do you tend to narrate the story? So back to Peter's sermon. So some hear Peter's sermon as a fire and brimstone sermon made to make people feel guilty. Uh, one in which he pressured the crowd and called them to repent, right? Let me offer you another perspective. So it is true, and by the way, it might be helpful if you have your bulletins in front of you, like I'm going to refer to verse numbers. Sometimes it's helpful to look. And for those of you at home, uh, if you've got a Bible, and we'll put some of the verses up online too. But, so it is true that Peter says to the crowd, you crucified and killed Jesus. It's right there in verse 23. So if you find 20, verse 23, I want you to notice what else Peter says there. He says, you crucified and you killed Jesus, but then he says it happened according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. And with those words, Peter is telling the crowd something very important about God uh, and about this whole Jesus story. What he's saying to them is, hey, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, it didn't happen by accident. They were all a part of God's plan to redeem humanity. Uh, and this reveals something really important about the character of God and who we are in relationship to God. You know what it reveals? 
it reveals that God actually cares about us and that God knew that we were going to botch this whole thing up, but God had a plan to intervene in human history and to redeem and restore us through the person of Jesus Christ. Uh, Here's the deal. In the eyes of God, humanity matters, and we're worth saving. So I need you to hear me say this in a different way. In the eyes of God, you matter, and you are worth saving. And the New Testament expresses this truth in all kinds of different ways. You almost can't turn a page without hitting this truth somewhere. John 3.16 says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Uh, For God so what? Loved the world. 1 John 4.10 says, This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and he sent his Son to be an atoning sacrifice for our sins. In Romans 8, I think Paul says this as as plainly as it can be said. He says, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not withhold his own son but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword Paul's basically naming everything he can think of here, by the way. He says, Does, will any of that come before, between us and, and the love of God? And do you know Paul's answer? No. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us, right? And I've got to tell you, I think this is one of the most important narrative shifts that we can make as Christians and in thinking about God. God cares for humanity, and it is God's plan to redeem us and to restore us in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, some people will will ask me occasionally, and it's a great question, all right, Brady, if God loves us and God's got this plan so much, why are we still in such a mess? Why, why, Why is the world in such a mess? Why doesn't God do something about it? Do you all know what the Christian answer to that question is? God is and has and will do something about it. This is the whole point of the Jesus story. God has intervened in history, and we are witnessing the unfolding of God's redeeming plan. We're in the middle of it. And by the way, we're called not just to sit back and watch. We're called to become participants in this kingdom of love and light. What is, why doesn't God do something? God is doing something. That's what we're here celebrating and singing about and remembering today. Okay, so right after Peter talks about Jesus being crucified and killed, he quickly moves on to the next part of the story, and we find it in verse 24. He says this, God raised him up, having freed him from death, because it was impossible for him to be held in its power. So the resurrection uh, was the primary focus of Christian preaching from day one. So by the way, this sermon that Peter's giving right here is the first ever sermon given by somebody besides Jesus that, that we have recorded in the Gospels. Pentecost takes place, Peter stands up, he's preaching, and one of the primary focuses of his sermon is the resurrection of Jesus. And again, this is something we see throughout the New Testament. Uh, This, by the way, is what all the David stuff was about that we just heard about. So uh, Peter is reminding the people that he's preaching to that even David uh, foretold the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, It's in verse 31. He says this, For seeing this, David spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, saying he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh experience corruption. And this is a quote from Psalm 110. But the point of this entire section is for Peter to say, Jesus didn't just die, that he was raised from the dead, right? Now, the resurrection is a powerful event that reveals some very important things to us about the character and the nature of God. I think one of the most profound things that it reveals to us is that God's power is greater than the power of sin and death. God's power is greater. So let me ask you something. Do you ever look at the world around you and feel a little hopeless? 
You ever flip on the news or read the paper or scroll whatever you scroll and go, oh my gosh, it's just such a mess. Anyone? Uh, How about your own life? You ever look at your own life and, and think, oh, it's such a mess, right? Well, let me ask you a question. If God can raise Jesus from the dead, which is at the center of the Christian proclamation. It's at the center of Peter's sermon. Uh, What's greater, the problems of this world or God? What's greater? All right, y'all need to do better than that. What's greater, the, the problems in this world or God? What's greater, uh, the sins and the things that you struggle with and that you think, you know what, it seems to me like this negative thing has got an upper hand in my life. What's greater, your sin or God? What's greater, uh, the difficulty or the challenge that you're facing, whether it's financial or health or relational, what's greater, that problem or God? Right, I mean, you get the idea here? We are more than conquerors, Paul tells us, because of Jesus Christ. So before the resurrection, I think the disciples would look at the world too and they'd think, man, it just seems like evil and darkness have the upper hand, doesn't it? But after the resurrection, that changed. Mark Trotter says this, there was a line right down the middle of their lives, before and after. Before the resurrection, when they were roughed up, they despaired about this life. They were sure that this abuse was evidence that death and not life is in control of things. But after the resurrection, no matter what happened to them, and worse things happened, they were convinced that it is love that is the strongest power in the world, and death is not the victor. So what if that's true? What if God's power really is greater than the power of sin and death? What if when all is said and done, God will redeem all the dark and evil things? If you believed that, what would change about the story that you tell yourself about what we're living in and and what's unfolding? What would change about the story you tell yourself about your struggles, about your fears, about your grief? So the final thing in Peter's sermon that I think is one of its most amazing features, and it's one that's very easy to overlook, is who Peter is preaching to. So it's right there in verse 22. It's one of the first couple of words we read. Who's he preaching to? The Israelites, tells us. So you got to remember, he's in Jerusalem, and he's talking to people who are gathered in Jerusalem for this festival. But you have to imagine that the people there, a lot of the people that are there in Jerusalem, they live in Jerusalem. Their houses are in Jerusalem. Their businesses are in Jerusalem. Uh, These are the people of Jerusalem. They're the same people that were in Jerusalem 53 days before and who cried out the words, crucify him, crucify him and turned him over to the Romans. Now, I want you to think about this for a minute. Peter's preaching to these people. Um, If you had been a part of that crowd that had turned Jesus over to be crucified, what kind of treatment would you expect from his friends and followers? I got to tell you, I would at 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 a minimum expect their contempt. Uh, At the worst, I would expect them to come after me and I might hide from them, right? But here is Peter preaching to them. Here's Peter saying to them, hey, the one that you killed is actually the one you were waiting for. The one that you killed is the one who came to love you and to save you. Can you imagine? Uh, Maybe they would have hung their heads a little bit in that moment. But he says, But here's the good news. He's not dead. And he's inviting you right now to follow him in the way that leads to love and life, right? Uh, In verse 39, Peter extends this invitation this way. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away and everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. So, You see what's happening here? 
Peter is inviting the very people who rejected and killed Jesus to become his followers and to accept his way. And I got to tell you, I really think that if there's anything that won them over, it's that. It's that, right? Uh, Maybe what cut them to the heart wasn't threats, it wasn't guilt, it was none of those things. What cut them to the heart was the love and the forgiveness that Peter was showing them in that moment. Hey, brothers, sisters, join me in the way of Christ. Join me in the way of love, right? Uh, By the way, where did Peter learn this amazing capacity for love and forgiveness? So at the end of hearing all this, the people ask Peter, what should we do? And this is when Peter says to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, repent does not mean what we think it means. We've all kind of picked up bad habits around this word. Uh, It it really, it's the Greek word metanoia, and what it really means is change your mind. Uh, It doesn't mean feel bad. It doesn't mean grovel. It doesn't mean beg for mercy. It's none of those things. What it really means is something like this. Wake up. Live in the way of love. Change your mind. Change your way. Turn to God. Follow Jesus. Walk in the way that leads to life, not death. And again, we're told they're cut to the heart, and 3,000 of them become followers. So let me ask you again. What do you think made the people respond in this way? Uh, Was it fire and brimstone threats? Was it the story of a God who's mad at humanity and coming to get us? Or was it the offer of redemption? What would motivate you? The story that we choose to tell has profound implications on our experience of life and our well-being. I know which narrative moves me. I know what story saves me. I know which story I choose. I choose the story of a God who loves humanity so much that he planned our redemption. I choose the story of a God who's Power is greater than sin, even mine, and greater than death itself. I choose the story of a God who invites even his enemies to walk and to join in the movement of love and life. I know which story I choose. How about you? In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.